Are you a businesswoman who is finding it challenging to get your ideas across and make a point? Welcome to Speakers Who Get Results with Elizabeth Bachman, a podcast dedicated to helping women get the visibility they want, whether making a speech or talking in a meeting. Every week, get valuable lessons from Elizabeth or learn from her roundtable conversations with experts and speakers on how to make a difference, not just a point. On to the show with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. Hello, and welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. I'm Elizabeth Bachman, your host, and this is the podcast where we interview experts from around the world on such subjects as communication challenges, leadership, diversity, visibility, and international communication challenges. Today, I'm the expert, and I'm going to be talking to you about how to make a great first impression even if you're speaking your second language or your third. But before I get into the content, I'd like to invite you to see where your presentation skills are strong by taking our free four minute assessment at speakforresultsquiz.com. That's www.speakforresultsquiz.com. And that's where you can see where you're doing well with your presentation skills and where perhaps a little bit of support could get you the results you need and the recognition you deserve. Today, I'd like to ask you, do you need to be seen as an expert when you give a presentation? Of course you do, we all do. But what if you're presenting in English and it's your second or third language? Do you ever worry that you won't be understood? Do you ever worry that you're going to make some silly mistake and people will go, oh, they don't want to, won't want to listen to you? Do you ever get nervous? If you do, you're not alone. I have many, many clients for whom English is their second or third language. And we do a great deal of work on how to be understood so that at the first, because at the top level, when you're really doing the high level speaking, you only have a few seconds to make a good impression. If, you're, if your listeners cannot understand you, they'll tune you out, especially nowadays when we're presenting virtually so much, it's too easy to shrink the picture, switch over to another screen on your computer and continue with your emails, et cetera. And then you've lost the opportunity to make that great first impression. Wouldn't it be good to know that you could present with confidence, knowing that you are going to be understood, knowing that you'll be able to reach your listeners and get them excited and engaged. It's a great feeling. The other side of this is that if English is your first language, you're lucky. English is the international language of business these days, but it might not be the first language for the people who are listening to you. It's common these days to be working with international teams across several time zones, and it's pretty common to have a manager or a supervisor who grew up in another country. English is not their first language. So it makes sense to pay attention and speak clearly. I learned this one the hard way. Some years ago, when I was directing an opera in Argentina, we were working in English and Spanish, and Argentinian Spanish, no less, which is very different from the Spanish I first studied. My assistant told me something which I misunderstood. She thought she was clear. I heard something else entirely. I passed it on to the producer and the producer took action. It turned out that the problem I had, I thought I'd heard was something else entirely. It wasn't a problem after all, but it caused two days of chaos. Feelings were hurt. There were a lot of problems. It was a mess. It all came out okay in the end, but my reputation was damaged. I think they didn't quite trust me after that, and I never went back. 
that was a very painful lesson. The good news is there are plenty of strategies and techniques that you can do that you can use to help solve this problem. My intention today is to give you three techniques that will help with this. The first one is how to become aware of the issue and aware of the way that you're speaking. Secondly, how not to make cultural mistakes. And third, how not to rush because we all do at something. Don't be taken over by nerves so that you speak so fast people can't follow you. These are the fine techniques that I don't hear other trainers talk about that will allow you to present with confidence, knowing that you are fully understood, listen to, that you can be with your audience to get them engaged and excited. Before I begin, let me talk for a minute about accent reduction. A lot of people find that if they're speaking English in, with an accent, most of the time you get for, you're forgiven for making little mistakes. Everybody knows that it's not your first language. But if you have a really thick accent, so thick that people cannot understand you, that can be a barrier. When that happens, there are two people I turn to. Rebecca Lindquist, who's the author of American Speak and who's been a guest on this podcast, and Judy Raven of lessaccent.com. One thing that Judy says is it's not about reducing your accent, as learning proper pronunciation, learning how to pronounce the sounds that exist in English and don't exist in your native language. I will put links to both of these ladies and to the podcast episodes in the show notes. Learning to pronounce properly and reduce a very thick accent is a specialty of its own. If people can't understand you, if it's an effort to listen to you, people aren't gonna want to make the effort. And that can be a barrier to promotion. It can be a barrier to getting hired. I've seen it happen over and over. It's not fair, but it happens. So if you have a very thick accent, invest in yourself and get help. Today, I'm talking for those of us who want to be understood well, and it's the little things that make a difference. I learned about this in my 30 years as an opera director, where we were expected to know at least two languages well, and to be able to get along in a couple of others. When you're working with singers, conductors, designers from around the world, one of the things we would do on the first day of rehearsal is get together and find out how many people would prefer to speak German or Italian or English. Those were the three main, the three main languages. And the language that the most people spoke would be our working language. So this is something I learned to listen for early on. When I started working with speakers, I realized it's something that a lot of people don't pay attention to, or they take for granted, or they don't realize that there are techniques you can use to be better understood. So I can hear you thinking, all right, Elizabeth, I get it. This is important. What are those techniques? The first and overall technique is to speak clearly, pronounce everything, and don't be in a hurry. Sounds simple, right? But things get in the way, it's easier said than done. The first technique I'd like to recommend is to put yourself in the ears of your listeners. Now, regular listeners of this podcast will know that I often talk about putting your shoes, yourself in the shoes of your listeners. And by that, I mean, it's rule number one. Make sure that, you're th that you know your audience, that you're thinking about what their issues are, what they need, and use strategic empathy to put yourself in their place. 
in this case, use strategic empathy to put yourself in their ears. Think about the words you're going to use. When you write a speech, remember that written language is not the same as spoken language. Be sure you practice out loud. You may find that there's a phrase that looks great on the page when you wrote it, but when you say it, it's hard to pronounce, it's complicated, it doesn't really work. Short words, simple words with consonants are the best. It's something that you can correct for if you have an important speech. So here's a technique you can use. If you have a big speech coming up and your English is not your first language, so you're a little nervous about it, ask a friend to listen to you or work with a trainer like me. Be sure you choose a friend who also did not grow up speaking English so that their brain doesn't just go ahead and fill in what they can't hear. Ask them to listen to you as you present your speech, don't look at you, and to make a noise or say what every time there's something that they don't quite understand that was confusing. When they make that noise, put a little check mark in your script but don't stop because you don't want to lose the momentum. You want to be presenting this the way you would be presenting it to an audience. Afterwards, you can go back and say, and find out where it was that you said something confusing and choose a simpler way to say it. Now, you might be thinking, but my speech is full of technical information. I have to use complicated words. And it's true, that's a very common challenge for the very smart people that I work with who give technical speeches and scientific speeches. The key then is to make sure that every technical idea has a metaphor to go with it because that will fill in for the brain what it means and make sure you have practiced your key phrases so that they come out cleanly. There's another technique that is a good way to practice, to become aware of where you're rushing and how to be clear. My friend Amira Ahmed asked me to help her with this. It's about how you say your name. The two words we say probably more than anything are our first and last names. If you have an unusual name in the culture where you're speaking, or if you are a uh, if your name, your first name ends with a vowel and your second name begins with a vowel, it's really easy to run them together. Amira asked me for help because she would say, hi, my name's Amira Mutt, and you never knew what her name was. I taught her to say Amira, Amira Ahmed. Say your first name so people can recognize it, have a little time to take that in and then say your first and last name. Because we've heard the first name already, we have space in our brain to promise to process the last name. Amira reports, she's been doing this for about five years now, and it's made an enormous difference to the way people respond to her. The second technique is to avoid slang or local references. Now, this may also sound obvious, but once you start paying attention, you'll notice how many phrases come from local knowledge, come from the language. For instance, if you're an American who grew up in New York, New Yorkers use a lot of Yiddish words. Yiddish is a wonderful language. It's full of colorful phrases. I heard a TV commentator the other day on a New York-based show talk about a mishigash. Now, a mishigash is a word for nonsense, chaos. And I understood because I used to live in New York, but if somebody was listening from Singapore or Mumbai or Marseille, how would they know? Be aware of the, the sorts of local cultural phrases that you use 
that might not be understood. The other day, my Swedish client, Antje, was working on a speech and I told her to beware of going down a rabbit hole. She stopped me and she said, you know, I've heard that phrase, but what does it mean? I realized going down the rabbit hole comes from the book, Alice in Wonderland, that is an English language children's book. If you grow up in any of the English speaking countries, you probably read the book, Alice in Wonderland as a child or saw the movie. Alice falls down a rabbit hole and winds up in Wonderland and has a whole lot of adventures and doesn't come back for a while. The phrase has come to mean getting distracted on social media. So suddenly half an hour has passed and you didn't know where, where you've been. In the case of speaking, in Ancha's case, it means going off on a tangent so that you lose track of what you were trying to say. It's a great phrase, but it made no sense. Anja grew up in Sweden. She'd never read the book. She didn't know what it meant. I am now trying not to use that phrase with my customers who didn't grow up speaking English. It's hard. It's a phrase I use a lot. Here's a practical thing that you can use. We all know as speakers that stories and metaphors are very important. Try using a metaphor around food. Everybody eats, and there are foods which have probably reached every country in the world. Uh, for instance, pizza. Italian pizza is a great metaphor you can use because all the different flavors, the things you can put on top of pizza, the way you bake it, regional differences. There are many ways that you can use pizza for a metaphor. But those of you who are listening, if you've ever used pizza as a metaphor, please send me a message. I'd love to hear how you use it. And if you haven't, send me a message and we could talk about possibilities, ways you could use it. The third technique is, as I said at the beginning, slow down. The problem is, or the challenge is, when we get nervous, it's really easy to speak very fast. It's hard to remember to keep a good standard pace, to pause, to take a break, especially if it's an important speech where there's money, say you're doing a presentation and you have to, to a sales presentation and you need to get that sale, or if your reputation is on the line, that's when the voices in our heads start telling us, Oh, they're going to think you're stupid. They're not, you know, they're going to, they're going to make some silly mistake. You'll forget what to do. When you get nervous, it's really hard to remember to keep the pace slow and to speak well. Here's a technique I use. What it's what the Germans call Geschwindigkeitsbegrenzungsschwellen, in English known as speed bumps. Speed bumps on the road are there to stop you from going too fast. When you are giving a speech, you can put a little notice in your script. Maybe you even write the word breathe or put in a smiley face to remind yourself to smile. Um, sometimes I get involved in technical information and I get very serious and I forget to smile. I like to put a little sun there. You can also do this with your slides. Not a smiley face, people will wonder what that means, but I like to put a little sun icon there. And when I see it, that reminds me to smile, to breathe, to pace. Another way of forcing yourself to slow down is to ask questions. Don't you think if you asked a question that would force you to change your tempo? Have you ever noticed that if somebody asks you a question, you lean in a little bit and pay attention? Wouldn't it be useful to make yourself break the tempo and change your tone of voice by turning a statement into a question? Maybe. These questions are very useful and speed bumps. These are just some of the many, many techniques I use when I'm working with a presenter. If you want more information, you can reach out to me 
at, connect with me on LinkedIn or reach out to Elizabeth at ElizabethBachman.com to review the things I suggested were slow down, speak clearly, choose words that are easy to understand, make sure that you pause, avoid slang and local language, and use speed bumps to remind yourself to slow down. It's really wonderful and we are really lucky to be living in a world where we can have colleagues from around the world. We can talk to people around the world. I love it that I have listeners from many, many countries to this podcast. If you want to make sure that you are fully understood, awareness is everything. The more you're aware, the more you can be sure that you speak slowly, slowly, clearly, and will make the impact that you want to make. As Jim Powell said, communication works for those who work it. This has been Elizabeth Bachman, Speakers Who Get Results. I'll see you on the next one. We have just concluded another great episode of Speakers Who Get Results with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. If you got value from today's episode, please feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues. You may also visit elizabethbachman.com for additional resources. Be sure to tune in every week for new episodes. And thanks for tuning in.